So in 10 years as a zookeeper, snake catcher, fauna rescuer, the jobs that I've done, I've been lucky to work with some pretty incredible people and some of them I've mentioned in some of our videos in the past. But today I wanna to share with you three people who I may or may not have met, who are what I'd consider my heroes as far as wildlife work and conservation goes. So stick around guys, we're talking about three people who have left a lasting impression with where I've ended up and where I want to go. So the first sort of wildlife hero that I sort of look towards uh, as an inspiration to myself would be that of, of Bob Irwin, Steve Irwin's father. Now, you can't work with wildlife without people asking you, know, you must have been inspired by Steve Irwin. And as a kid, I certainly was. And as an educator, I certainly am. The way that he touched the public. But one thing I found when I started working with wildlife professionally was it become very easy looking at somebody like Steve Irwin to think, look, I could never do that. He, he grew up in a zoo and he was jumping on crocodiles by nine and catching crocodiles alone in the bush in his early 20s. Uh, and it's easy to almost become disheartened as somebody wanting to work with wildlife, thinking, well, I need all that. How could I possibly you know, match something like that? And uh, it wasn't until I started becoming more involved with wildlife that I started to learn his father, Bob Irwin's story. You see, Bob Irwin was not a zookeeper by birth. Uh, he wasn't even particularly involved with captive animals until his 20s. He was a plumber from suburban Melbourne, where I grew up, albeit a long time before I was in Melbourne. Uh, and he, he raised his three kids in a house in suburban Melbourne and basically had a pass to interest in animals. He was interested the in them, house. but never worked As you can see by Squeaky's He was in his here. 20s when, during a fishing trip, they decided to keep a tiger snake that they'd found uh, and one tiger to snake turned into another animal turned into another animal. So he basically had a, a large private collection that he started in his mid-twenties. Uh, in 1971, by the time he was in his thirties, uh, he decided that they'd like to move to Queensland uh, and open their collection up to the public. And that's where uh, Beerwa Reptile Park, which eventually became the Queensland Reptile and Fauna Park, which of course turned into what we know today as Australia Zoo, started. Uh, and Bob moved his family up there. They lived in a caravan for several years while he built the place by himself with his bare hands. Every path that was laid, all the enclosures that were put together. Uh, yet, he didn't have a degree in biology. He, he wasn't a zoologist. He was a hard-working bloke from suburban Melbourne who loved animals, so made his dreams happen. It wasn't until his mid-30s that he got a chance to start catching crocodiles. And of course, you know, it was what he learned that he taught his son that made crocodiles famous in the eyes of millions of people. So Bob Owen became a real icon or a, a real hero to me to look towards of just what's possible for what might be an average person when they really decide to do it. Now, of course, today Bob Owen's not involved with Australia Zoo, but he still does a lot of amazing work. In fact, in 2010, being somewhere in his 70s, um, Bob took it upon himself to drive 2,000 kilometres from his home in Queensland to Adelaide in South Australia to help dig out by hand southern here in those wombats that had been buried when their holes were pushed in by farmers. And he continues to do, do lots of work for this. It's only now that he's starting to slow down. So the guy's a wildlife legend. But at the end of the day, the biggest reason I think we should look to somebody like Bob is, uh, you know, pick your heroes and decide who their heroes were. And Steve, time and time and time again, pointed out that his father was his hero. He looked up to his father, he idolised his father. And that shows you that, you know, there has to be a lot that we as wildlife enthusiasts could learn from somebody like Bob Irwin. So today, Bob is probably the number one person that I think of when it comes to, you know, what I think wildlife people like myself could aspire towards. Speaking of looking towards your hero's heroes, the second person that is a personal hero of mine and really an unsung legend in you know, the world of Australian zoology uh, would be that of David Flay. So during the 1970s and 1980s, when Bob Irwin had moved to Queensland, started a zoo with very little zookeeping experience, it was David Flay who at the time owned David Flay's wildlife park uh, in Queensland that mentored him along. And Flay is a wildlife legend in his own right. Now, David Flay was born in 1907 in, in a city called Ballarat, a couple of hours west of Melbourne. He was originally trained as a teacher, but his big passion was always wildlife. And his list of wildlife accomplishments is absolutely insane. Every Australian should know about it. In fact, in the 1930s, David Flay was the last person ever to photograph Benjamin, the last Tasmanian tiger ever to have officially existed. 
So, and he carried a scar on his bum where he was bitten by Benjamin for the rest of his life. In 1934, he was asked to help redesign the native animal section at Melbourne Zoo, one of the oldest zoos in Australia, one of the best zoos in the world today, where he was the first person on earth to successfully breed the emu, the tawny frogmouth and the koala. A couple of years later, he became the first paid director at Hillsville Sanctuary, which is probably one of the largest collections of native Australian animals on earth. And uh, there, his list of accomplishments just continued. The most famous of which, in the 1940s, he became the first person ever to successfully breed platypuses, which nobody else would repeat for about 40 years after he'd done it. He was also a pioneer with the art of milking snakes to make antivenin in Australia, and was actually the first person ever to, to milk a, a taipan for venom. A taipan which had actually killed the person that caught it and ended up making the first taipan antivenin in Australia. So he had some amazing things. But in 1951, he then moved to Queensland with his own private collection and started up David Flay's Wildlife Park, which he ran up until the mid 80s before it became a government owned zoo. David ended up passing away in 1993 but by the time he did, he had published several books, many, many scientific texts, and he'd be the first person to breed all kinds of Australian animals. In fact, the list goes that he was the first person in history to breed platypuses, mulgaras, koalas, sooty owls, grass owls, masked owls, powerful owls, crested hawks, grey goshawks, wedge-tailed eagles, tawny frogmouths, emus, taipans, and yellow belly gliders. So, as you can see, the guy was absolutely innovative with captive husbandry of Australian animals and zoos would not be where they are today without the work of David Flay and the sad thing is most Australians have never heard of him. He was the Steve Irwin of the last century and he should be an Australian icon and for that reason he is the second person that I've Doesn't always looked that. towards as my wildlife. And I remember Sir McFarlane Burnett. The third person who, who served as a real inspiration to me with regards to working with wildlife and, and what's possible when somebody wants to work with wildlife is Romulus Whittaker. Now, Rom Whittaker was born in New York, but he lives in India. He is a well-known herpetologist in India, uh, and he today is the owner and the director of the Madras Crocodile Bank, which has almost all the crocodilian species on Earth, and it's sort of a genetic bank for, for crocodiles in India. He's also been involved in establishing research centres for king cobras in the Western Ghats, uh, and for sea turtles on the Andaman Islands, and contributed towards the conservation of things like gharials and... Uh, other crocodiles in India, all sorts of Indian reptiles. Before that, he, he'd started working in America with Bill Haast, who is a legend amongst you know herpetology around the world. Uh, and when he'd finished work for Bill Haast, he decided he wanted to start a serpentarium uh, in India. So he started the Chennai Snake Park, which he'd ran for several years. But during his time running the Chennai Snake Park, he started a really innovative program working with the Urula, a tribal group in southern India. And this is why he is a, a hero in my mind, the way that he's thought about this. You see, the Arula are a group of snake and rat catchers who for hundreds of years have caught, tracked and killed rats and snakes in India. And they've made their living for a long time with the snakeskin trade. And prior to the 1970s, they were exporting millions, tens of millions of snakeskins every single year. And in the 1970s, the Wildlife Act came in and rightly so, uh, catching, killing snakes for their skins became illegal. But this left the Arula jobless and put them in a situation where many other groups of people might turn towards something like poaching. Rom, what he basically did was he spotted a chance for these guys to become incredibly useful and keep their skills that they'd worked on over centuries. What Rom decided to do was teach the Arula, rather than how to kill snakes, use their tracking abilities, teach them how to catch snakes and milk them. And today, the Arula Tribal Cooperative are the sole group of people that collect venom to make antivenin in India. So all Indian antivenin is made by the Arula, thanks to the hard work of Rom when he was working at the Chennai Snake Park. And uh, there is a million snake bites a year in India, and 50,000 people die. So an awful lot of people are alive today only because of this tribal group of people who for centuries have caught and killed snakes, being taught how to, to milk snakes and, and make antivenin, thank you, to Rom Whittaker. The reason I find this story particularly inspirational is as wildlife enthusiasts, it's easy for us to sometimes, you know, look at good and bad and black and white. And we, we hear stories of, you know, poachers in Africa being eaten by lions. And sometimes people say, well, good. 
But the sad reality is these are people and when they disappear, someone else takes their place. And for long-term solutions to come into place, we need to think outside the box. And Rom, for doing this, for, for rounding up their ruler and teaching this and, and making this their way to keep their lifestyle going in a positive manner and make wildlife worth money to them is you know an inspiration and it's something that we need to look at for species all the way around the world because the more we can get people involved with wildlife we don't want to have the wildlife and the people because we become disconnected to them the more we can become involved with wildlife and have wildlife as part of our lives in a group like this does the more that we come to depend on these wildlife and as a result we're going to protect them so there you have it guys that's just three people out of many many more that have been personal sort of inspirations to me wanting to work with wildlife and people that I think everybody out there should really know their story. But I'd like to hear from you guys, you know, for a start, are you enjoying these sort of bonus content that we're doing a little bit more personal? Uh, we're going to keep doing it every Monday as long as you guys like it. And every Wednesday, we'll do our species spotlights that you guys have all subscribed for. But on top of that, let us know in the comments, what wildlife people do you look up to? Was it Steve Irwin? Is it Steve Backshaw from Deadly 60? Who do you look up to? What conservationists do you think deserve more credit or more attention? Uh, let us know in the comments. Between now and then, if you haven't already, please subscribe to our YouTube channel, like us on Facebook. And if you want to help our videos come out more regularly uh, and contribute to our channel, see your name in the credits of our videos maybe, check us out on Patreon. It's the support of our patrons that uh, not only helps us get out and visit other collections and film with animals that I couldn't show you personally, but it helps things keep on going behind the scenes here as well. So patreon.com forward slash wicked wildlife. Last of all, guys, thank you for watching. Please check on back Wednesday. We've got lots more cool videos coming out, but between now and then, be nice to wildlife. Have a good one and take care.